In the 1990s, with the emergence of Executive Outcomes and then later uh, Sandline International, you had a change in this stance. You had companies which were overtly there to fight wars, not just to provide protective security, but indeed to conduct offensive operations should a client require it. The single unique thing about Executive Outcomes that grabbed people's attention, that they were, in effect, their own non-state military force and a relatively complete military force. I mean, it wasn't just the people with a bunch of guns. They had their own organic airlift and air transport. They had combat helicopters. In Angola, they trained Angolan pilots in the use of fighter jets and, in some cases, piloted their own fighter jets. Uh, you know, they didn't have their own Marine Corps. The Executive Outcomes episode is something that's unlikely to be repeated again in history. Executive Outcomes was something of a transitional organization between the old-time African mercenaries and the, and, and the modern PMCs with corporate respectability. The deal was started during apartheid, and it was basically like any other uh, consultancy here. They, they had people with skills and they worked with the government, you know, training, intelligence gathering. It recruited most of its soldiers from uh, military and police units that were controversial and were thought, um, you know, it, it was thought that it was better to disband them. So, for example, 3-2 Battalion and Kufut, both of whom were a combination of, of South African troops and, and Angolans and Namibians. If you know the story of Soil, where Tony Buckingham's company and some other oil companies had uh, very expensive equipment that was trapped in a port called Soyo and they had to get it out. They were paying money for it and they couldn't use it, so they needed to dislodge the rebels. They were contracted to um, liberate an oil installation from Unita occupation. Simon the Man put together a quick little mercenary operation in which they dislodged the uh, Unita rebels and they brought in the Angolan army, which they then lost control of it. But it was the re-emergence, the resurgence of the white mercenary in Africa. But it was done in kind of an odd way. It wasn't just a bunch of guys that got together, did it, got paid, and went home. They said, hey, well, this could be a business. I mean, this, this is something we could offer other people. Executive Outcomes' mission is to provide the most professional military training related to land, sea, and air warfare. One thing you have to understand is that oil enterprise in, in, in Africa is entirely government or parastatal owned, so there's no free market operating in the African oil sector. Dos Santos, the president of Angola, sent for one of the owners of EO and said, I'd like to talk to you some more about training my troops and sort of basically helping me fight the rebels, because if you remember at that time, the MPLA and Unida were fighting for control of Angola, and Unida had control of the diamonds and oil areas and so on and so forth. So they're basically strangling the government. Uh, EO hired up, I guess the final number was around 400 people, and uh, began to train the army, realized that this wasn't probably the most efficient way to do that, and essentially stepped into a combat role with everything from helicopters to fuel air bombs to whatever, and they kicked the shit out of the rebels, which basically allowed Angola to negotiate with the rebels, create a peace accord, and get back to business. This is really a turning point in the history of the private military sector because the audacity of the executive outcomes operations showed people that, and, and in particular showed corporations that even though there's a civil war going on, business can carry on as usual. Bill Clinton's administration pressured Angola to get rid of these South African mercenaries and replace them with more sort of politically correct group like MPRI. So EO was essentially told, okay, that's nice guys, but see ya. Just luckily they, they essentially got on a plane and flew to Sierra Leone and began that operation, which was to uh, help an embattled administration fight off the rebels, and they did that very quickly. Those are two instances of where if you bring in qualified military personnel, they can deal with things very quickly and very little political fallout. His first effort, in fact, was in, in Papua New Guinea, where he got a contract um, to uh, take over a, a little island um, which basically held a giant copper deposit. Bougainville is a small island that is supposed to belong to Papua New Guinea, 
but for years has decided that now they're really not part of Papua New Guinea because they're ethnically and geographically, you know, separated. Bougainville itself um, was producing all this copper and it all went to the Australian company. They just happened to have a mine that provided about 45% of Papua New Guinea's hard currency. The control of this, uh, this copper deposit had, had been lost to the local people who were upset with the environmental damage. So local people shut it down and they seized control of this island. So in Papua New Guinea's eyes, hey, you know, you guys are rebels. We're going to go kick your ass. We're going to hire mercenaries. Sir so Julius Chan, the prime minister of the country, worked with Tim Spicer to figure out how to seize control of the island. His idea was bringing these Russian-made helicopters, you know, start shooting, people would get afraid and they'd seize the island. Now, what happened at that point gets a little murky and, and the government essentially, according to Tim Spicer, turned against him. And especially because when the Papua New Guinean military discovered that these mercenaries from another continent, another country were coming in and being paid 10, 50 times as much money, they were pretty upset. We could have used that money, that 36 million kina, to, uh, to form the Ted Battalion and get our equipment and our logistics in place. And I'm definitely sure that uh, we're quite capable of uh, solving the Bougainville crisis. And so they rebelled against Tim Spicer uh, and put him in jail. And then the government, you know, was a little afraid of what was going to happen next. They tried him, bribes were paid, and Tim Spicer fled the country. The whole operation went south. Uh, the island of Bougainville is still in the control of the local people. They were not able to seize control of the island. History has proven that that was a bad idea because these people actually are entitled to their autonomy. I quite frankly, don't see um, that much difference between the way mercenaries were deployed in the old days in Africa and, and you know, the, the way they're being, the way PMCs are being deployed today. They're, they're primarily there um, for their own commercial interests and for the commercial interests of other people.